All right, so welcome everyone, just so that you know that you're in the right place. This is uh, CSE 365. Anyone not in the right place, the doors are all around here, so feel free to just make your way out. Um, I feel like it's still not on, but try clipping it up here. Okay, so uh, basically today we're going to start off with basically kind of a getting to know you. We'll hopefully dive into some actual security stuff. So I'll introduce myself first and a little bit about what I do, what this class's purpose is, what the role is, uh, some of the awesome uh, people we have to help you be successful in the class, the TAs and undergrad TAs. And um, then we'll go over syllabus like we need to do. And finally, we'll get into real stuff. So uh, for those that don't know me, I'm Adam Dupe. Uh, you can call me Adam, please. Or Dr. Dupe is fine, too. I don't know, whatever you want, but I prefer Adam. Um, I got my PhD at UC Santa Barbara in 2014. And there, I really kind of, actually, well, the, the main way I got started is I did a five-year bachelor's master's at UCSB, so similar to the four plus one program we have here at ASU. And after I graduated, I got a job at Microsoft up in Seattle as a software developer, and I was like, I'm never coming back to academia ever again. I'm gonna make tons of money. Um, it's gonna be great, and actually it was great, so Microsoft was awesome, but I, while I was there, I kept working on my master's project, which was a paper that we had written, and. I kind of fell in love with research, and I really wanted to do research, so I went back to UC Santa Barbara for my PhD, uh, and I've been back in academia, I guess, ever since. Um, and part of what drew me into security was playing Capture the Flags, uh, which is a CTF games. Um, these are kind of ethical hacking games where you compete against other teams in order to break software in such a way that you're able to steal a piece of data called a flag, and that flag is proof that you were able to break the software. Um, so I did that at uh, UCSB with a team called Shellfish, and then I kind of restarted this group called the Pwn Devils. Um, so they actually have a CTF this weekend. Uh, we are fortunate that the president of the Pwn Devils is here, and so he's going to tell you a little bit about it impromptu. So I didn't tell him he was going to do this. Hi, everybody. Introduce Sorry, yourself. This is also very impromptu. I'm Zion. I'm the captain of the Pwn Devils team for the president. We do CTFs, like Adam said, which allows us to kind of travel to the edges of the world. Just this year, we got to go to uh, Vietnam and Poland. All of these trips are, of course, free. This weekend we're going to be playing a CTF, so a CTF is kind of what Adam said, we're trying to steal a flag that proves you broke the software. Later in this class, your guys are going to kind of talk about how to pwn software, and on the Pwn Devils we teach you how to really start doing that. So if you guys would like to come down, we're doing it this Saturday at Brickyard on the fourth floor. Um, feel free to join our Slack. If you don't know how to get there, feel free to message Adam, oh, it's right there too, and also come and find me over here in the front. Just Hit me with your laptop, and I'll write in the codes, and we'll start hacking. All right, thank you. Please come down. It'll be super fun. Free food. When did, when did you start as the Pwn Devils? Oh, I, I started the Pwn Devils when I was a freshman. I joined it. How much did you know? Nothing. Maybe, like, even less than you guys did. I joined here barely knowing what Linux was. And then um, freshman to junior now, I'm the captain. You can change a lot in just one year. Or a semester. Or a semester, or even a semester. Cool. Uh, yeah, so please, these are kind of, if you really find yourself super interested in security, these are the kind of ways that you can really hone your skills and develop even you know, industry relevant skills. Like many, we've had people who go from the Pwn Devils to go working at the NSA, and part of the reason is they have on their resume that they played in CTFs, they know how to exploit crypto and binaries and all this kind of fun stuff. Um, okay, so then the amazing people that will help you in this course. So Stephen is here. Um, I'm going to save time. I'm not going to introduce everyone, but Stephen's here. He's great. He was our TA last semester, so he's intimately familiar with this material. Um, he's going to make sure you have a great time. Uh, Arvind, I don't think, is here unless he's here. Stand up. Okay, uh, you'll see him, and I'm going to mess up your name again, even though we just covered this. Uh, Marzi is in the corner over there, so 
these are the people that are going to be helping you as TAs. We also have a number of undergrad TAs for this course. Uh, so if you're an undergrad TA, can you please stand up? I think we may have. Yeah, so this is Riley. He's going to be helping you. We'll have a number of other undergrad TAs. These are people who literally just took the course last semester. They are well primed to know what to do. So a little bit more in the way of introduction about me. So part of what I do now is I'm a, I don't know, co-captain of this group called the uh, Order of the Overflow. So we're a group that put on the, essentially the Olympics of hacking. So this is a capture the flag competition that occurs every August, uh, co-located with the DEF CON security conference. And all of these CTFs throughout the year, the goal really for people is to qualify to participate in this final capture the flag event in Vegas, this DEF CON capture the flag. So we held this last event in August. Um, uh, in August, it's a, the final event is a two and a half day event. Um, I think it's a total of 24 hours. It's 10, 10, and four of actual game time. Uh, but to get there, you actually had to qualify first. So there were six qualifying CTFs from around the world. So the winners of those CTFs automatically qualified for the finals. And then we had about 1,200 um, teams that competed in our qualification event in May 2019. So these teams played a CTF that essentially had a board full of challenges, and the goal was click on that challenge, figure out what it says, maybe it's a piece of software that you need to analyze for vulnerabilities and then write an exploit against. Maybe it's a crypto puzzle, maybe it's a, um, I'm trying to come up with examples, but the problem is we're preparing for this year, so I don't want to accidentally uh, come up with an example that's going to be used. Um, so all kind of, this competition ran for 48 hours straight. Um, so it's a 48 hour competition. Um, so in the end, the basically from the qualifying event and from this, the top 16 teams qualified. So uh, PPP was the team that qualified in first place and also ended up winning the competition. They um, are from Carnegie Mellon University. And so to give you, so we invite 16 teams to come physically compete. So this 1200 teams is all online. So we bring everybody in, each of the teams get eight people at a, um, around a table, and then they get a network table that gives them access to the game, and then we can start playing. So this, I believe, is a video. So this shows you the And now, off my bridge. Scotty, ahead, all back to one. I'll get projectors up showing various visualizations of what the game is going on. Um, and on the second day, kind of the cool thing we did is we gave, I uh, don't want to ask questions that are going to date me, but uh, we gave each of the teams an original Xbox One that we had modded to play Doom when they connected it to our network. Um, and what they had to do, we put bugs in this Doom game. So they had to basically figure out game hacks and find ways to actually kill, like uh, beat everyone else for points. So this is one of the challenges. So this is uh, people playing Doom in, on a, running on an original Xbox One uh, that we gave them. And so to give you a breadth of kind of what kind of skills and things people do at the Olympics of hacking, uh, they hacked iOS apps. So an app like Telegram, um, they had to figure out vulnerabilities and write exploits for those. Uh, they hacked uh, every, anyone interested in deep learning? Nobody? Machine learning? I'm shocked. I thought that was like the hot topic that everyone wants to do. What do you want to do then? What's the hot topic? Get a job? <laughs> Security, obviously. That's what you want? Okay. Awesome. Um, so deep learning models have a number of ways that they can be attacked. So you can, um, for instance, we had deep learning models that were trained to recognize a flag. And then just from that model, you could actually recover the flag that it was trained on. Um, by kind of pulling apart this neural network. Um, the challenge I worked on was a Lisp machine. So in the 80s, uh, some folks at MIT created a machine that actually ran Lisp, uh, technically Lisp microcode, but ran Lisp essentially on the CPU. So the entire operating system, everything was written in Lisp. And so I wrote a web server on top of that that the teams talked to and then had to reverse engineer from a binary image of this Lisp machine. Um, what the vulnerability was and exploit it. Um, the Doom running on Xbox, um, another cool thing, run it, writing x86 code that would run uh, no matter how many bits were flipped and actually do something useful. 
Uh, so in the end, we had a, a long game. A lot of teams played. Um, overall, the PBP, the Plaid Parliament of Poning, so this is us at the uh, award ceremony at the end. They were the winners. They won and their prize. So I don't know. What do you think a prize is for something like this? A million dollars. Uh, unfortunately, no. So I do not have a million dollars to give them, unfortunately. Uh, the conference, I guess, also does not yet. Um, so it's not quite at the level of like esports or something like that. But so A, they get something that's way more important than money. What's that? Yeah, the cred, the status, right? They get seen as the people who won, and they've won, I think, three out of the last four years or something. I, they've won a lot of these uh, these competitions, so they get seen as kind of the best hackers in the world. Uh, and they also get from the DEF CON Security Conference a what's known as a, they get eight uh, black badges. So these are badges that give you free access to the DEF CON Conference for life. So they're super prestigious. Each year they're custom built. Um, so you wear those around the conference, and everybody knows you're super cool because you have a black badge. And I think they just have collections of them now. They probably have just a trophy case of just black badges uh, stored up. Um, cool. Any questions on this? Background, a little bit about me. No? Don't be shy. There's not a lot of us here. Cool. All right. So a little bit to kind of get you situated on where you are inside, let's say, security at ASU, right? So where we are here. Um, so if I know, well, I don't know if I should ask this. Maybe I'll go later. Who's here just because they have to take this class because it's required? Who is actually interested in security? Yeah, I appreciate that. I think a lot of you are lying, but that's OK. Um, so depending on how this class goes, maybe you'll be more interested in security. So to go further in depth, we have uh, two undergraduate cybersecurity concentration programs, a BS in computer science and a BSc in computer systems engineering. This essentially allows you on your uh, degree, it will say concentration in cybersecurity. Um, we also have three graduate programs, if you're interested in that, at the MS, MCS, and the PhD level. Uh, you can find out kind of more about here. So essentially, at the BS level, you need a minimum of 15 credits in cybersecurity and related areas. And basically, you can take, we have a number of security courses. So this is in, well, sharp contrast to other universities. So many places are lucky if they have one security course. We have a number of them covering all kinds of different areas. Um, the goal of this course, to kind of situate it, you're going to get a broad base into all areas of security. So you're going to understand um, what does security even mean. We're going to talk about things like access control, um, things like crypto. We're going to talk about crypto. We're not going to go super into depth in e any of these things. Um, but we're going to cover all the bases so that you basically won't embarrass me if you go out and interview for a security job after this class. So you'll understand everything you need to know. Um, the other courses are designed to go more in depth into different areas. For instance, uh, 466 uh, with Jan Shochitachvili is much more focused on exploitation. So how can you analyze software for vulnerabilities quickly and automatically write exploits for those? Um, network security gets you more into networks. Forensics gets you more into forensics. So you can kind of choose what courses you want to go to specialize in. Uh, the other really interesting thing is that we have a, um, so the NSA and the Department, of, so uh, National Security Association? Agency. Agency, there we go. I, I knew it wasn't uh, those other ones. Okay. And the Department of Homeland Security basically have designated ASU and the cybersecurity program a National Center of Academic Excellence in Information Assurance Education. What this means, and a cool aspect of that, is let me pull this up. Um, so on the center's website, we have a nice thing. Ignore that video. It's quite embarrassing. Um, we have a really cool opportunity for students that's because of this accreditation. So if it was just like a, I don't know, a fancy certificate we could hang up somewhere, it probably wouldn't be worth it. Uh, the cool thing is we have a number of scholarships to give out to really good uh, students who want to work and pursue this area. Um, so the basic idea is this is called a scholarship for service program. 
where the government will give you one year of tuition and stipend, and for every year of tuition and stipend that you get, you agree to go work for the government for a year after the fact. I believe it can cover two years of undergrad or masters, and you can do, I think, three total if you do like a four plus one, so you do two undergrad and one masters. I believe that works, but don't quote me on that. Um, so it's actually so a really great program uh, for students. Um, yeah, so health insurance, um, travel to conferences. You do summer internships with a federal agency so you can see what it's like to work at these places. Um, a couple of caveats. You must be an American US citizen and permanent resident because you're going to go work for the federal government. A lot of these jobs, although not the majority, I mean, the majority of these jobs require a security clearance. Um, and so you must be a full-time student, have to have a good GPA. The GPA thing is really about you being competitive because you're gonna be competing with these jobs. It's not a given that they just give you a job. You have to actually earn a job at an organization. Um, so if you're interested, feel free to email me. I can send you this information. I can send you to more places, but this is a super cool way to um, essentially get paid to study security stuff and then do that in industry. So. Then after you do your service, you're now well positioned to either continue working for the federal government or use your expertise and your access to a security clearance to become a consultant to earn a ton of money and to do consulting work. Any questions on that? I feel like I have to scan. Okay. All right. And now this class. All right, so why do we go over the syllabus on the first class of essentially every class? <coughs> Academic integrity is part of it, yeah, what else? What is it? Yeah, the syllabus is essentially the contract between me and you, right? So I'm setting up my expectations for what I expect for the class, and essentially you're, by continuing to be in this class, you're agreeing to it. Um, I don't know, I guess if you have any super big concerns, you should raise it now, but uh, I, I'm willing to entertain any interesting ideas. So uh, the TAs and I will be hosting office hours. We'll specify the times and locations. We will try to make it so that uh, office hours will be spread throughout the week so that you'll be able to get the help that you need when you can get it. Um, also, we're always available by appointment. So if you can't attend an office hours, then uh, feel free to reach out to us and we can try to figure out something that works. Um, okay, sorry, can you read this in the back? I should have asked first. Can you read it now in the back? You don't have to read it, read it. It's on the website. Um, okay, so basically, as I mentioned, this course, the goal is cover all aspects of security. We're gonna be touching on a lot of different areas, and the kind of important thing I want you to think about, and one of the important takeaways, is it's not, security is not just a technical concern. Right? You have to understand the organization, you have to understand the business goals of whatever you're trying to secure, and also think about maybe potential legal requirements, uh, ethical issues, all of these kinds of things we really wanna uh, discuss. Um, there's a textbook that's recommended, so basically everything you need for this class I will cover in lecture. If, but you're totally free, this is a great book, so if you want, I have on the website mappings of lecture material to content in the book. So if you wanna get the book and um, get somebody else's explanation of it, that's not me, I won't be offended. I feel free to do that. Um, okay, course communication. So before we talk about this, I want y'all to look around. Look around the room. There's 370 people enrolled in this course. It's a lot of people. There's very few numbers of us, as you saw. Right? So communication and effective communication is super important. Uh, so essentially, we'll use, let's see if this works. Yeah, okay, I haven't done anything here, but uh, so essentially we used this last semester, I think it was pretty successful. Uh, we'll use the course Piazza as a discussion board for the course. So follow the link here, sign up. This will, I will do all announcements through the course Piazza. Um, we'll have all so if you have a question, the best way to get an answer is to uh, ask it on the course Piazza and then we can, um, then your other students should please help each other um, 
and we can come in for tricky things when, or if it's a question for us, right, that a student clearly can't answer. Um, it's totally okay to help each other over concepts or things or discussions. Um, last semester was really successful. I think we've got some really good um, communications on there. Um, okay, other important thing. Have you ever learned how to ask a question beyond basic grammar? Like, of course, you know how to phrase a sentence that ends in a question, like is a question, right? Hopefully, please. Okay. I highly recommend if you've never read this article before, um, there are many different ways to ask a question about the same issue. Have you ever maybe got this from a friend or something that said, my code doesn't compile, here's a screenshot. Is it easy to answer that question? No, why not? You said no, right? Do you want to answer anyways? I don't know where the sound comes from in this room. It's crazy. Um, it's more while I drink water. Needle in a haystack type of thing. Yeah, it's a needle in a haystack. And it doesn't provide any context of what it is you're trying to do uh, specifically. So if you have an error, that means you're trying to do something, but whatever's happening is not what you expect it to be. Without understanding what you're trying to do, like what are you trying to accomplish? Why do you think it isn't working? What steps have you taken to determine what the problem is? Right? And then what error messages are you seeing that aren't in a, in a screenshot? Because odds are what I'm going to do is copy and paste that into a Google search form just like you can do. And I will try to figure out what could possibly go wrong with that. Right? So this type of thing is like, this is going to be a skill that I highly recommend you start developing now as you go out there into the workforce and you're part of a team. If you're known for sending these kinds of issues to your team, uh, that is a bad look, right? You want to say, it's okay to ask for help when you're stuck. I'm not saying don't ask for help. Um, but there's a good way to ask for help and for suggestions that it highly, highly, highly increases the chances that you're doing something good uh, or that you're going to get a response. And on Piazza, if you're going to include some source code or something, you can make the post private just to us so we can maybe see snippets of code to see what's going on. Um, these are all tips that are super important and very helpful and will help us help you because we want to help you. Any questions on asking questions? <laughs> make it a good question. No, I'm just kidding. All right, covered that. And the other thing that I think, uh, I know some students find a little bit frustrating with at least a little bit of my style of teaching um, is, so I've done this for a long time now, when you bring a problem to me, I'll probably know exactly what the problem is very quickly because I've seen this 20 other times from other students. I will not tell you exactly what the problem is, why? <laughs> yeah. So what did you actually say? Because you won't learn anything yourself. Yeah, you're not going to learn anything, right? If I just keep telling you exactly what's wrong every time, you turn into you turn me into an oracle where every time your code doesn't compile, you bring it to me, and I have to point out the null pointer exception that you're getting over here or whatever it is. Uh, the goal is for you to develop skills so that you can learn and think um, and solve the problem better yourself. So what I'll do is I will ask you questions to lead you in the direction of where I think the problem is. So maybe, huh, that line's funny. What's that line doing? What is that function doing? What's the documentation of that function say? What arguments does it take? What arguments are you passing in? Uh, is it possible that this value is null here at this point in your program? Those kinds of things. And so I encourage you on the mailing list to think kind of similarly. So rather than all the time maybe just giving the exact solution to the problem, although sometimes that is fine, um, really think about and maybe point them to resources that can help people solve their problems. Like, oh, I Googled, and it seems like the Stack Overflow post maybe is similar. And so then that helps people help themselves. Um, yeah. Cool. Any questions on that? Asking questions. All right. Uh, and a lot of this, some of the stuff that we do in this class is very kind of puzzle based. So solving security challenges, it's almost like a puzzle. 
So if you give someone straight up the answer, that's not, you're taking away the joy of them figuring it out for themselves, uh, which I swear there is. Um, so don't share solutions or answers. It's forbidden. We'll talk about plagiarism. Uh, if you want to ask us a question, so I could have showed you, but my email box uh, has essentially been overflowing for the last like two years. So every three months I'll do a just archive everything, and then in three or four months I'm back up to like 500 unread emails, and it's just insane. So um, I will do my best to answer all of your emails. Uh, if you really have something for me, like it's totally fine to communicate with me over email. Um, if I don't reply to you right away, please follow up. So that's a way of ensuring that it goes to the top of my inbox. Uh, other things, is Piazza has a very nice private message feature that goes to just the TAs and myself. So we'll be the only one that sees that. So feel free to ask questions through there. It's much easier for us to respond on there. Um, and finally, this happens uh, frequently. So dealing with the... So if you think about the imbalance of the number of students versus the number of me and the number of TAs, right? So if you ask a question, it's highly likely somebody else has a similar question. So if it's not private in nature, then I will likely make a Piazza post out of that email. So it's usually better just to start with the Piazza post. That way we can start from there. Um, and that should be good. All right. Uh, these are the topics we're going to cover. We're going to hit a lot of different areas. Um, kind of what we hit depends on, uh, the, my classes are more discussion based than kind of anything. So I never know exactly how long things are going to take. We may have time for web, we may not, who knows, we'll see. Um, but we'll get to a lot of this stuff. It'll be really fun. Okay, <clears throat> cool. So evaluation, um, we're going to do homeworks. So exams and in-class capture the flag competitions. So I'm still working out the logistics of how this will work. It's not going to be for another, I don't know, probably two months, maybe more. I, basically, like midway towards the end of the semester, we'll have two in-class CTFs. That'll be super fun. It's essentially graded on a participation base. So as long as we see that you're participating and doing stuff and you know it's not a who got first place or who didn't get first place, that I'm less concerned about. Um, so more details will be forthcoming, but it should be a fun in-class way to uh, hack on stuff. There'll probably be five to seven homework assignments, again, depending on how much stuff we cover, uh, covering the material presented in class. There's a midterm. It'll cover everything discussed on the lectures up until that point and the assignments. Uh, no notes or outside material or devices will be allowed. Uh, there'll be the same thing, final exam that covers comprehensive, I know, in 14 weeks, you will continually ask me this question. Um, it will be all the final exam will be comp comprehensive, all the material of the course, with probably an emphasis on the second half that wasn't tested in the midterm. Um, no notes, outside material, devices, nothing smarter than a pencil is the way I like to say that. So, um, so the grading, so midterm and final are each 15% of your grade. CTF will be 5%, and homework will be 65%. So the bulk of this class, I guess, is on the assignments because this is where you actually apply. So we can talk all day about concepts and lecture of breaking crypto or brute forcing hashes or, I don't know, um, finding vulnerabilities in software. But until you actually go do it, that's where the real meat is. So that's why the bulk of the points here are in the homeworks. Questions on that? Okay. So this is the preliminary grade thresholds for each of these. What this means is that if you get a 93 or above, you're guaranteed an A. I'm not going to raise these thresholds. So it's not like an A would be 95%. Um, I reserve the right to lower them if I need to. So I may lower the A range to 92. Or um, I think in a class like this, there'll be so many people that I probably won't touch it. Because you'll all be right there, and if you start lowering down, it's like, oh, well, that person's close, and that person's close, and then all of a sudden, there's like no place to put it. So, just warning you now. So don't count on that. Um, I also don't. I'll, I'll put this in here. I'm going to say it now. I'll update this, but I do not round any grades. So there'll be a number of opportunities throughout the course for extra credit. If you feel like you may be in a situation where you would like rounding, do the extra credit. 
Make sense? And I've had to reply to emails where somebody got like a 90, what would it be, an 89.8. Like, sorry, there's actually somebody who is 89.9, so sucks. Questions on grading? Not a lot of questions in this class. I'm a little worried. We're going to start calling randomly on people. Yeah? Is there a chance that the midterm or the final will be at all curves? Possibly. Yeah, I, it usually doesn't happen, but I've had it in the past where, let's say, one problem was very unclear or something like that, and so the um, the top score was like a 95, so then I'd make 95 the new 100 and upgrade everyone just to reflect it. So, yeah, I always look at that, but it usually doesn't happen, but we'll see. Anything else? I feel like you guys are so far away on that side of the class. I'll try to walk over there. It's just weird. I don't have a clicker yet. Okay. All right. Homework due dates and exam dates. So kind of, uh, let's see. Is that for here? Yeah, let's see. All right, so I guess this gets into, so I'm experimenting this semester with using Canvas. I've never used it before. I usually always use the course website. So yeah, cool. So right now, there's just a link to this website on Canvas. I'm gonna use Canvas for grade scope integration and probably to give you your grades. I'm not 100% sure on that, we'll see. Um, but essentially, everything you need will be on this website. So. Um, We'll post dates of midterms, finals, when assignments are due. Um, we will post all the lecture slides will be up here. Um, I will, I don't know when I say this, but I will try to record the, all of the lectures, which I am doing now. Ooh, I just got our attack again. Um, so I'll try to record all the lectures. What I'm recording, as you'll see from the videos, is the sound from this mic and the screen. So. That's it, and I don't do any editing. I just take it and throw it on YouTube, and I put a link on the website. So, um, I don't know. My philosophy is essentially like, you're paying for this class. If you want to show up, show up. If you don't want to show up, I don't care. If you have a doctor's appointment and you have to miss class, I don't care. Like, just watch the video. I'll try, but it's no guarantee. So, if technical things happen, I'm not going to re-deliver a lecture just because it, the recording crashed. Um, but I will try. Uh, if there's any reading, it'll be posted here. Uh, basically everything will be posted on the course website and announced in class and also announced on Piazza. Um, okay, so <clears throat> basically, so for assignments, if they're, like assignments are due at the date and time that they are due, um, you have plenty of time for assignments, so I don't really care if it's a little bit late, uh, that's late. Uh, basically, for each day that it's late, it's a 20% deduction. So if you have a 100% assignment that you submit on the second day, then that's an 80%. And then the day after that, it'd be 60, and then go down another 20%. Um, your highest score, so I'm still setting it up. I'm going to try, well, I'm going to try something slightly new, but basically it'll be an auto-graded system, so submit all of your stuff and you'll get to know your grade right away. And it will always be the highest grade that you've ever gotten on that assignment is your score. Questions on that? Yeah. Uh, what you're saying is you can submit that whole time until you get the highest grade level? Yep. So if you submit late, then it doesn't matter. Your highest grade over all of your submissions will be your score for that assignment. Question behind that? Does your website have any sort of RSS or added feeds? So that I have no idea. Good. No, I don't think so. Okay. But all the updates will be, well, yeah, no. Maybe, actually. I have no idea if there's an RSS feed on there. Does RSS still even work? Is there any RSS readers? Interesting. OK, I'm seeing nods, so apparently yes. Okay. Yeah, if you figure that out, let me know. Okay. Um, 
folks registered with the DRC, happy to support all of that. So just register as normal. We'll work around whatever we need to work around. That's totally fine. Okay, this is the least fun part of every semester. Well, I guess the second least fun part of every semester. The least fun part is when I have to uh, write people up for plagiarism and cheating. That is the absolute worst part of my entire semester. So don't be the person or people that makes me do that. So consider this now the big scary warning of don't doing that. So uh, you already all know basically what constitutes uh, plagiarism and cheating. What does that essentially mean? You have an ASU student code of context, conduct and an ASU student academic integrity policy. Don't cheat. What does cheating mean? Sharing or receiving any work that's not your own. Yeah, so, you know, like, I don't know. To be perfectly honest, the way I think of it is, like, I'm not asking you to do busy work. I'm asking you to do stuff that's going to actually help you in your career in the future. So um, we have a lot, you know. So it's really hard to cheat at your job or plagiarize at your job. Uh, you could get in serious trouble for IP issues and all kinds of issues. So. Um, you know, we're trying to turn you into really good computer scientists who can go out and do awesome stuff. And this is how you do it, is by doing assignments, coding things, uh, reading code, all that kind of stuff. So, um, but of course, I understand. So, I too, when I code, am constantly Googling for things and maybe taking a snippet from Stack Overflow or some website on how to do some certain thing. I understand, and that's totally fine, and I'm fine with this, provided you cite your code. So just put a comment above that that says, hey, I got this from this Stack Overflow link. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Like that way, if it turns out that you and another student's code matches, we can say, oh, they use the same Stack Overflow thing, great. Right? If your comment is, I found this on somebody's private Git or public GitHub account, and it's the entire assignment, right? That's clearly not okay. That's so using any students, other students' code, past, current in this class, uh, current student in this class, past student is a violation of the academic integrity policy. So, and there's a zero tolerance policy in this class. Basically, any violations of academic integrity policy that we discover will result in a zero on that assignment, and you will also be reported to the dean's office. So the dean's office keeps a list of all the people who've been um, who plagiarized on an assignment. So the first time, basically, you meet with um, somebody in the dean's office who explains everything that's going on. You sign a thing. You have the ability to appeal if you want to. Um, and then you get put on this list. And then if it happens again, that's when you get like the penalties increase significantly to like expulsion or. Um, yeah, all kinds of really bad stuff. So, um, and if you ask me, well, how do I know exactly how this process works? Because I've done it 27 times. So, um, you submit code to us. Uh, I've had, I've had, I've seen all kinds of things. I've seen students submit code and ASU like names and ASU IDs of other students. Still in the comments. I've seen stuff where people try to change it around a bit, but it still matches, and it's very easy to tell that it's exactly the same. Um, you know, I've seen literally all kinds of stuff. If you ask me, I can tell you more stories. But um, so don't don't be that person. I don't want to have to do it, so just don't do it. It'll be we'll all be happier for it. You'll be better students. Uh, the thing I will say is I understand a lot of times as much as I would want you not to, students often wait till the last days or minutes or hours to start an assignment. And then by that point, they realize it's more difficult than they thought it was, it's gonna take them more time, and they're under all this pressure to get an A, maybe they have a scholarship that's gonna go away if they don't get an A in this course or whatever. And so then they end up copying somebody's code. And so I've seen all of those, I've had all of those excuses and all of those people still got written up and reported and all of that. So. And because I don't really, honestly, if you're going to do terrible work and plagiarize and not learn on your own, then that's, I guess, your prerogative in some sense. Uh, the problem is the other students who work super hard on their assignments and get a C, 
even though they spent you know 40 hours on the assignment and are in my office hours every week um, you know it's not fair to those students that you get an A because you cheated but they took the C and they took their hits and um, so I'm just trying to make things fair this is how we do that um, so some examples these are just examples they're not limited to this sharing code with a fellow student collaborating on code with a fellow student submitting another student's code as your own submitting a prior student's code as your own, and even sharing another, uh, uh, submitting some, another, uh, posting your code online. So this is another problem that I run into often. Um, there's really, so why do you think people, or if you have, why do people post assignments on something like GitHub? Yeah, to show experience to your employers. What experience is it showing? <laughs> that you don't do any. So it, it shows something, and, and that, but this is the, the problem. So um, put yourself in the mindset of a recruiter for a company, or, or like what I've done for Microsoft is I would go to campuses and try to recruit people, right? So one of the things I ask is, oh, well, what have you done outside of class? Why are employers interested in that question? Yeah, it shows that you're motivated. What else? Yeah. Initiative. What else? Like yeah. Trajectory. Trajectory you like the code. Yeah, that you like the code. Yeah, what else? It shows that you've done something that hundreds of other people have. Right. Literally. Not even hundreds, like thousands of other people. So if you think about all the computer scientists across the country at all these institutions, they're all doing assignments like this. No employer actually cares that you wrote a compiler. Like literally everyone through a CS program does that, right? The assignments in this class are the same way. They're not at the level that's going to impress an employer, trust me. They're um, literally junior level assignments, right? Um, so what employers are interested in is what are you doing outside of that, right? What are you coding? What apps are you making? What um, websites are you developing that are on your own that are different and outside of your curriculum? Just like when applying to schools, they wanna see what extracurriculars you're doing because everyone does the normal course stuff. They want to know what other stuff you're doing. So this is why it's, it's A, I mean, it's against the academic integrity policy to post your code online. Um, and this is things that we and the department searches for. Um, I understand the need or the want to put your code in a repository like GitHub. I think that's totally cool. But there's a great, now I think you can have unlimited GitHub private repos. And there's even a student pack where you can get like paid GitHub, which gives you more stuff. So there's really no excuse and no reason to have your code from the assignments online. Any questions on plagiarism cheating? Yes. Um, if posting your code online is forbidden, then what? what's the policy on posting a snippet to like a Stack Overflow? Uh, interesting. Um, it de that's one of those things that depends more, right? I mean, is a snippet like three lines of just how to iterate over an array because it's not working? Like that, I think would be fine. But if it's the, if your question is essentially the assignment description, then that's a problem. And if your code is also what you've done for the assignment, um, people on Stack Overflow are usually pretty good at sniffing out if this is a homework assignment question and you'll likely get very little responses. So use your judgment, I think, is the best part. Uh, and I think, you know, we've seen a lot of these similar problems, so ask us, I think, would be my response. And presumably your code's on Stack Overflow because it's broken, right? So it's probably not a good base <laughs> to start from. Any other questions? Concerns, comments? Cool. All right. So of us. Anything else we need to talk about? Yeah. Sorry, louder.
Uh, Dupe is, I believe, a French name. I think. At least that's the family. I think it's like French Canadian is how, which probably comes from France. I don't know. I have no idea. All right. Anything else? Yep. Oh, what languages do I know? How do you define no? Like no well enough to like tutor in? Ooh, that's a tricky question. Um, well, I, I'll say this. My main language is Python. So, like for instance, I wrote all of the um, game code for the DEF CON attack defense system. So database and database API and all the different components that need to work together to make the game work. Uh, all that's in Python 3. I guess I just recently, a year and a half ago, made the switch to Python 3. Uh, a lot of my old code is in Python 2. <sighs> Let's see. I mean, I, all, I enjoy programming in C. I think C is very fun, really awesome low-level language to code in. Uh, C++, I have literally haven't done since my undergrad. So uh, professionally, I did C-sharp development. So all of my stuff at Microsoft was C-sharp. And I've done a research project in that. Um, I really like weird and esoteric languages, so I did a research project in OCaml once. No, 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 that's not. Uh, yeah, OCaml. Okay, it was okay. Um, and I really like like Haskell. Um, I like Lisp-like languages too. I don't know. I kind of like different languages. JavaScript, although that's a really annoying one, but. Ruby, I guess I did a lot of Ruby on Rails back in the day. I don't know. It's also, this is the thing with security is you have to read a lot of other languages. So you'll have some challenge that's written in Lua and you'll have to be able to read Lua code to understand what it does or Perl, which is insane to understand. Um, so yeah, you should definitely be learning different programming languages. I think that's useful. All right, anything else? So that's the intro. Let's get into real stuff now. All right. First thing we're going to talk about, what, well, what is security? What do you think of when you hear security? What does it mean? These ones are not. I didn't know if we'd get to them or not, but uh, there's not a lot of content. It's more of the discussion. Yeah. Whatever it takes to get the software to run as intended. Oh, okay. Whatever, whatever it takes to get the software to run as intended. Interesting. So why is running as intended important? I built a solution. So yeah, so I, you want the software to run in the manner that it was developed for and for who it was intended to be used by. Yeah, that and sounds way better when you say that. Getting rid of so security is getting rid of known vulnerabilities. So if there's a known problem, then that is important to get rid of it. But I'll throw the hands over here. something that's supposed to be restricted. 
So what are some examples of these kinds of things? So maybe let's try maybe more concrete. A wall? Yeah, a wall in what sense? So what part of it? Why is that useful for security? Brick wall keeps the outside threads out. Yeah, so a brick wall keeps outside threads out and inside threads in. How do you move from one to the other? <laughs> a door? So maybe a door. And then how do you, to that example, to the other example, how do you, um, how do you prevent unwanted people from moving inside to outside? Lock. Closing the door. A lock and key? Yeah, so then what does that mean then? So in this scenario, you're protecting your essentially personal security, right? Or physical security, we can say. By building walls and a door and with a lock that has a key so that only people that have access to that key can access it. So what would be some known vulnerabilities with that system? Someone could lose the key. Yeah, you could lose the key and get locked out of your own little, I don't want to call it a house because it's not very <laughs> sad, but <laughs> thing that we've developed. Yeah. Lock picking. So somebody, so lock picking would be essentially somebody who does not have a key being able to get access into the house by attacking the lock. Key duplication. So how can you make copies of keys? You can literally just make it, go to Home Depot. There's machines. You don't even have to talk to a person. You can go there, have them make a copy of the key. What else? Yeah. Destructive entry. So like smashing the wall. Yeah. You can. Somebody could smash the wall or um, the door or the lock. Yeah. Tailgating. Tailgating. Essentially, lock picking is kind of that one by one with pins. I don't know. I'm not a very, I'm not even a good lock picker or, uh, yeah. So yeah, but that's kind of the philosophy behind that. Yeah. Can you, oh, sorry. Persuade someone to give you access. Yeah. Can you just trick someone to give you access, right? Like maybe pretend to be the owner and call a locksmith who then comes and lets you into this house. Um, yeah. Pretending you're someone with a key. Pretending you're someone with a key. Uh, yeah, so yeah, or the thing about keys themselves, the crazy things, um, people can take a picture of a key, so they have a, uh, I guess I'll show you mine. Don't take a picture of my key. <laughs> I'm actually taking a seat, so I don't care. Um, so, right, so essentially the ridges on this key, right, correspond are how, what essentially unlocks the door. So if these ridges are not correct, your key is not going to go in and it's not going to be able to turn the lock. So if you were to take a picture of this, probably even with like iPhones or phones nowadays, you could fabricate a key. So you could then make a copy of somebody's key just from a photograph of the key and not from the actual key itself. Um, other ways I've heard about this is, I think it's more like in prison movies for some reason, is like pushing the key into a bar of soap. And then that gives you the ridges. So you can make a copy key based on the imprint of that key. So if you have access to a key very quickly, you can make an imprint like a mold almost, and then put the key back so nobody knows that you took that and have that. Um, the, uh, I think it was one of the big newspapers, I think it was maybe the New York Times was doing a story on, um, I think it was the MTA, so like the um, subway system in New York, they have these uh, skeleton keys that get the maintenance access to any room, and or maybe it was the firefighter's keys or something. And they published a picture, like a high quality picture of these keys. <laughs> so they had to completely change that because like, now literally anyone could make one of those keys. Um, so these are all aspects <laughs> 
and thinking about security. So what do all of these things have in common? Because we've been talking about, we started talking about software, and then we started talking about uh, building a crazy house thing around us uh, to mediate outside threats versus inside threats. So what are some of the things that they have in common? Yeah. Vulnerabilities. Vulnerabilities. So vulnerabilities in this would mean what? weak spots, right, or ways to subvert the security of the system. Um, yeah? They all have in common that there's actually somebody that wants to get into emerging. Right, there's an adversary that wants to, let's say, like a little higher level, wants to violate the security of our system. Right, so in one case, it's breaking into our house, in another case, maybe breaking into a software system, right? But there's some adversary, an active adversary that's doing that. security, what are vulnerabilities? Um, the way we think of security is we try to kind of classify security problems into three different areas. Um, and we've touched on a lot of these. So the first one being essentially confidentiality, which essentially means keeping things that are supposed to be secret, secret. Right? Or another way to think of this is only the people that should know about this thing know about this thing. Right? So what are some examples of confidentiality that are that you've seen in or that are maybe important to you? Yeah. Social security number. Your social security number. Why is that important to be confidential? What's that? Identity theft. Identity theft. Yeah, with your social if I have your name, your social security number and maybe a few other pieces of information about you, I can go open a loan in your name, right? Which you're actually now on the hook for until you can prove that it wasn't you. And you may not, not know about that for years until I take that $10,000 out of that loan, I never repay it, and I'm $10,000 richer, and you have this loan attached to your name. I can open up credit cards in your name. What else, what other confidential things? Everyone got real quiet. Medical records, yeah, why is it important to keep medical records quiet or confidential? Insurance? Insurance in what sense? Yeah, so you want to keep maybe your medical condition private from your, maybe your insurer, maybe your employer uh, who could take action against you based on your medical condition. Yeah, there's entire laws governing the collection and um, of medical information. What else? Cool, so all of these are attacks of confidentiality. What about the your phone? Is there anything confidential on your phone? Mm, I see a lot of people's eyes getting bigger. <laughs> yeah? Pictures, text messages, location data, where you've been literally since you've owned 
that device, right? Every place you've been. There is a great story of, uh, I don't even know if it's still popular, Pokemon Go? Have you heard about Pokemon Go? Uh, there is a great story about a uh, woman catching her boyfriend cheating because he caught a Pokemon at his ex-girlfriend's place. <laughs> So, and so some aspects of confidentiality which we'll cover, access control, so this literally is what we're talking about with the door and keys, who can get access to a room. Uh, you can think about my ASU, how does my ASU know me from you from anyone else? Um, we're gonna go into this more in depth. We'll also cover encryption, so encryption is another way that I can ensure that a piece of data can only be read by people with the key, the right key. And we'll cover that, we'll cover how to break it, all fun stuff. Um, one thing we didn't necessarily, I don't think, touch on as much. So what about something like integrity? So that, let's say data or things are only changed by people or things that should change them. So do you, are you concerned at all about the integrity of your bank account? Well, some of you, it depends on how much is in there, right? <laughs> um, but if you, you know, on, and if you're concerned only in certain ways, if you woke up there's an extra $10,000 in there, you probably wouldn't be super concerned, right? But if you woke up and there was $0 in there, then you'd be very concerned, right, of where that came from, who made that change, so the integrity of data. What are some other areas where integrity of data is important? Facebook. Facebook? Yeah, why? Oh, it's not important. Oh, it's not important? Yeah. Well, if somebody was just able to modify your Facebook profile to be whatever they wanted it to be, right? That could be a, maybe even a reputation attack against you, and that would be something not wanted. Yeah, in the back. Uh, databases. Data, databases, yeah, what kind of databases? Like research, um, finances. Yeah, finances, or uh, what about your, Social security records, there's a great uh, scene in, it must be hackers, uh, in a movie where they change somebody to be deceased on a database, right? So it was hackers, yeah. And so imagine now you go to ASU to get your financial aid and they're like, we're sorry, you're dead. Like you can't collect this financial aid. Um, you know, that sucks, that's a huge hole to uh, move out of. Uh, what other integrity things are important? Grades. Why are those important? Who cares about grades? Nobody just puts B where they should go, or I mean, the next one so A where they should go. Yeah, it sucks if it's lower than it should be, right? Yeah. Your search history. Your search history. Ooh, integrity of that. Now, why is that important? It also has some confidentiality uh, things. So yeah, what if somebody's trying to frame you for murder, right? And so they're able to insert things like how to hide a dead body in your search history. So, by the way, the government can subpoena Google for if there is a case. They do that all the time. And they get access to all your search history of like whatever you search. They see, huh, right after this person was murdered, there was a Google search of how to hide a dead body. Um, it's very suspicious. So we'll look into kind of ways to, different ways to kind of um, prevent data from being modified or detecting when data and when things have been modified. Those are super important. Um, we're doing good. Cool. Okay. So the last one is something we haven't really talked about a lot, although we talked about, when we talked about what is security, we talked about the problems of losing a key. Why is losing a key a security problem?
are locked out of our own house if we want, like in this scenario, right? So we're locked out of the system. We can't use the system. What are other ways that uh, not being able to use the system could be could be a security problem? Yeah, so then we have to think like an attacker and break our way in, right? Anyone ever uh, break into their own apartment or house? Yeah, it's amazing how you start thinking like an attacker, right? And you're like, oh, that tree is really close to the window, and I know I didn't lock that window. So if I can get into that tree, I can go up to the second story and then open the window and then get in the house that way, right? Or you start realizing how easy it is to take off uh, all of those plastic, <laughs> like the mesh things in front of the windows, right? And then I can just slide the windows open. Actually, a little bit of a tangent, but that's what we're trying to develop for you in this class, is that adversarial mindset of how do I break this, how do I break into things. Um, so it's very important. So what about, um, so, yeah, so then this gets into kind of the third area of, of security. So this is what we call the CIA triad. It's very easy to remember. CIA, confidentiality, integrity, availability. Uh, literally, I've had multiple people tell me that this is one of the first questions I get asked in a security interview. This is something to definitely remember, and it's important to think about because now you can, if you're asked to kind of analyze the security of a system, you can start thinking about it through these three lenses, right? What are potential problems against confidentiality? What are potential problems against integrity? And what are potential problems against availability? So some of the things we'll end up talking about in this class is denial of service attacks. So this is, so what is it? What's the problem if you were able to like take down Amazon for a half hour? Is that a security problem? Yes. yes. Why? Yeah, massive loss of income. I don't know what it is. You can probably look it up. Um, but we're talking of multiple millions of dollars. I mean, a half hour is a long time for a site like Amazon. But um, if people aren't able to, so what happens is oftentimes. But why is it difficult to take down Amazon? into it when we talk about that service, but they are very big, right? What if I targeted more of a medium level company and their website went down for 15 minutes, they lost a million dollars in revenue or even whatever, $500,000. And then they got an email from me saying, oh, sucks that your uh, website's down. Uh, lucky for you, I'm in the business of, um, let's say, anti-denial of service. Uh, and so if you pay me $10,000 in Bitcoin, I'll make sure that your website gets back up. Um, and to prove to you that that's true, your website will be up now, but it'll probably be down in another 10 minutes. Right? So I can stop my denial of service attack, their website goes back up. 10 minutes later, I launch my attack again, and I send a follow-up email. It says, here's my Bitcoin address. I would like $10,000 worth of Bitcoin. And these are things that actually happen. I mean, people um, do these kinds of stuff. So. Uh, it's important to be thinking about all aspects of, of this. And so, what are some, so we talked about what is security, we talked about vulnerabilities. Um, we talked about this a little bit. One of these key aspects of security is what threats are there against our system. So, does every system suffer from the same threats? secure your house differently? Why? Okay, one is more resources, sure. Yeah? Because like those CEOs have like millions of dollars security budgets a year. So, but think about a person. You're you're no, worth ten million dollars. So you can, but why do you do that, right? So yeah, you can hire additional people, you can do all this stuff, but why? 
There's more. Yeah. You're a more visible target, and therefore you're subject to different threats than you just are as a student going about your life. Right? So threats, the important thing to think about is even under the same, let's say, scenario of securing a home, the threats are different based on the context of whose home is it. Right? So these are important things to think and keep in mind when designing and talking about the security of a system. What are the potential threats against this system? Um, you know, think about banks have pretty good security. Things like Fort Knox have higher levels of security, and things like uh, nuclear launch stations have very high, like, high levels of security, right? So all of these are all dependent on what the threats are. Um, what other threats are we worried about in not just those scenarios, but scenarios that we've talked about today? SIM card swap, yeah, that's a really bad one. Uh, does everybody know what that is? So a SIM card swap, right, what gives you access to your phone number is your SIM card. So in a SIM card swap, essentially, um, people call your carrier, pretend they're you and that they're your phone number, convince them that you've got a new SIM card and they need to activate it with your number and deactivate the old one. Why do people do this attack? Why do they care about your phone number? Two-factor authentication to get Yes, your two-factor authentication token, which is usually enabled in high-value things. I actually had a student in my class a couple years ago that uh, had their Coinbase account where they had Bitcoin stolen because somebody did a SIM swapping attack against them and was able to get the two-factor authentication token and log in as them. Yeah, it's crazy. What else with the phone? Are you worried about sleeping? <laughs> this is something we used to do, mess with people in our lab. They would fall asleep in the lab, so we take their thumb and unlock their phone? Right? No? Nobody's done that? Okay. Cool. Um, okay, so yeah, there's a number of ways we can kind of classify threats. This is good to start here. I'll see everybody on Thursday. And you'll have your first assignment on Thursday.